What's going on? Good morning from the Build Series live here in New York City. I'm your host, Kevin Kenny, and our guest today is Mike Rowe. He has seen and held some of the dirtiest jobs in all the world, including QVC. His uh, show on Facebook Watch, Returning the Favor, is back, enjoying its third season, and we've got a clip of it for you to see right here. Hop in there, stud muffin. My lucky day. <laughs> we have never done anything this big. We know what you want. We know what you need. What you're doing, it's huge, and it matters. She's a US Air Force vet who devotes all of her time to other veterans. We're preparing these young men for life. She's one hell of a person. You're a guy that doesn't want any glory doing a thing that more people need to know about. Yay. All right, let's ride. Reaching out, changing lives. Cue the door. We got a check for $30,000. Oh, my God. Is she going to cry? Yes. Now we have a show. It's like a dream. We're here to do one thing. We're here to return the favor. All right, joining us now, Mike Rowe, everybody. Hey, guys. How are you, Mike? Fantastic. How are you? Yeah, I'm great. Thanks for coming by. I love your shoes. Thank you very much. Yeah, these are great. They're versatile. I thought you might appreciate them because you can work in them, but they're also kind of sneakers. So if you yeah. want to go skateboarding. These are uh, what you call Wolverines. They're made by hand up in Michigan with something called horseshoe leather, and it's the same exact thing they were using in 1869. It's the same exact, they haven't changed a thing except for the leather. Are you a history buff of sorts when it comes to clothes like that, or? Well, uh, fashion is not my go-to strong suit, <laughs> but I'm a fan of history, sure. There you go. <laughs> is that, I, jo I joked at the top of this QVC gig. Yeah. This is true. Oh, sure. Is this well-documented? This is the first time I ever heard it, like, looking you oh, It's not only well-documented. It's thanks to YouTube. It's it's undeniable. Oh, really? You know? yeah, yeah, like, when you can't outrun your past, you might as well embrace it. And yeah. if you were to go on YouTube and Google my name and search QVC, you would see me, among other things, selling a cat sack, which is essentially a toy for a cat. <laughs> it's like a garbage bag, and it's lined with mylar, and your cat crawls inside, and it rolls around. And it makes crinkling sounds. We sold these. You know, we sold everything. How we did you sell the cat sack? Can no. you give us like a little demo? Not well. No. <laughs> no. No. I mean, we actually, <laughs> there was an existing video of a cat crawling into this bag, rolling around, and I thought it was a joke. I thought everything was a joke back then. You know, I mean, it was the middle of the night, and I was sitting there on live TV trying to figure out a way to, you know. It was live. Oh, yeah. Three hours live every night. For me, midnight to 3 a.m. What do they give you? I've always wanted, like, I'm like, we're going to talk about the new show. Don't worry. Sure. But I want to talk about QVC really quick. Like, yeah. what do they give you? They give you the product, and then they're just like, hey, here's like three bullet points. Do well, your thing, back Mike. The, this was 1990 when I started, and I basically lost a bet and wound up auditioning for this thing on a lark. And I talked about a pencil for eight minutes. So they hired me. And the training program back then consisted of you you going on the air and you sitting there, they, they just brought you things and you were either prepared or you weren't. And so for me, it was, it was a very different world. I, they brought me something, I think the first product was a health team infrared pain reliever, which looks like a flashlight. It's got a little red thing on the end okay. and infrared light supposedly comes out and you rub it on your arthritic knuckles and you feel better. I, again, I didn't, I think it was real. So uh, I just looked at the camera and said, hi, everybody, I'm Mike, uh, I'm the new guy, and I got the health team infrared pain reliever here, and um, I don't really know what it is, so if you call the number <laughs> on the bottom of the screen, ask for Marty, the producer, he'll put you on the air, and maybe you could explain it to me. And that's how I sold stuff on QVC. I let the viewers do it for me. That's amazing. I, I, was, I was struck to learn, because, you know, I've seen you throughout the years on all the different shows and the commercials and whatnot. I would have assumed you were, uh, you know, a tradesman turned TV host, but it's actually kind of the opposite. You it's actually totally the opposite. Yeah, it's totally. You, you uh, pursued oh, the career in, in singing, I even heard, and acting. And Well, look, the thing about the handy gene, you know, my grandfather, you know, was a master everything, and he lived right next door. And I was sure I was going to follow in his footsteps. The guy, the guy could build a house without a, a blueprint, you know. But that gene is recessive, right? And so I just didn't, it didn't come easily to me. He suggested I get a, a different toolbox, which is ultimately why I started studying things like music and writing and acting. And it worked out well for me. You was, know. It, was it rebellion at all? You know, just being a teenager, like kind of wanting to go against the grain? Not really. It was, I mean, look, I was just enamored of, I, I looked at my grandfather as a magician, honestly. Mm -hmm. he, he only went to the seventh grade, but by the time he was 30, he was a, a master electrician, plumber, steam fitter, 
could fix anything. You take this watch off, blindfolded, put it back together, you know. And so I just, I just loved that. He would wake up clean, go out into the world, and come home dirty. And whatever the problem was had been corrected, you know. He was a genius, and I just was enamored of that. And, uh, you know, a lot of things happened to me between my teenage years and when I was 42 and, and sold Dirty Jobs. Right. But ultimately, Dirty Jobs was a tribute to him. And, uh, yeah, stayed on the air. For, it's still on the air. Well, I mean, time. the story, this is a great story, and you've told it plenty of times, but you were at CBS, I understand, right? Yeah. And then uh, a family member, I don't, know, I don't remember who, but they called you, and they were like, you know what, you know. My mother called me. Okay. I was sitting in my cubicle at CBS in San Francisco. I'd been impersonating a host for a show called Evening Magazine, right? And I'm, I'm just sitting there one day, and she calls and says, Michael. Your grandfather, he's, he's not doing great. He was 91 at the time, I guess. And she said, you know, it would be terrific if before he goes, he could turn on the television and see you doing something that looked like work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, because, you know, it, my grandfather had seen me do a lot of weird things. He saw me sell stuff in the middle of the night. He saw me sing in the opera. He saw me do a lot of things that didn't look like work to him. So Dirty Jobs was really a tribute to guys who, and women, who woke up clean and came home dirty. And during the day, fixed something, built something, you know. Do you find it ironic at all? And I don't know if you've ever been asked this, but, you know, you, you kind of, you go against the grain. Not to rebel, but, like you, you know, you do go and you do your own thing uh, as a, you know, 18-year-old, 19-year-old kid. Yeah. And then you find your greatest success, dare I say, in that other field, doing almost like the family tradition, right? Well, a version of it. Yeah. You know, I never really looked at my career as like a study in rebellion, but it more like a reverse commute. Yeah. So for me, you know, in uh, dirty jobs was a, a a big deal. And part of the reason it worked was because for the first time in my career, I stopped impersonating a host and became a guest. So it's like a subtle shift, right? But when, when, when you're out hosting shows, there's an expectation that you're going to do your research, you're going to do your homework, you know, and you're going to hit your mark, and you're going to say your line, and you're going to be convincing, and you're going to create the illusion of you know, competence where maybe there really isn't any. That's what I've been doing for a long time. Dirty Jobs, thanks to a very strange journey through a sewer in San Francisco and a rat intervention... <laughs> You know, trained me, honestly, that it, I, I would do better uh, telling the truth on camera and being as competent or incompetent as I am. So the trick to Dirty Jobs was to make sure the viewer understood that this is my first day on the gig, and I'm not an expert. And if I'm working with a welder on the top of the Golden Gate Bridge or an opal miner in the middle of the Australian outback half a mile down... Whatever it is, I'm not the expert. I'm, I'm the new guy. And you're going to get a look at that guy's job through my experiences as a guy who's having his first day on the job. It was a very different kind of uh, construct, uh, but it worked. And uh, it changed really everything I've been doing. I mean, including this thing. I'm the same guy on returning the favor. I was going to ask, you find yourself in the same position? Always. Yeah. Look, we don't do second takes. We don't rehearse. I mean, there's a production entity that does a lot of work leading up to it. But my job basically is to show up right before principal photography starts. And with me, I have, I guess you'd call it a behind the scenes camera, but we call it a, a, a truth cam. <laughs> right? So the truth cam never stops rolling. So, you know, Dirty Jobs wasn't really a show about Dirty Jobs, it was really a show about the making of a show about Dirty Jobs. And so was Somebody's Gotta Do It, which was on after that, and so is this. So you always have a camera that's kind of like a fly on the wall that's showing you how the sausage gets made, you know? And then uh, we cut it all together. So you see the show, you see the point of the show, but you also get to meet the producers and the camera people and me, and you see us trying to get this thing off the ground, right? Right now, if, if, if you were doing the show the way I do my shows, there would have been a camera back there in the dressing room with me as I desperately searched for creamer for the coffee, <laughs> which there was none. And then, you know, I mean, you, 
it starts when you get out of the car. Yeah. It, it doesn't start. My life doesn't start when somebody says action. It and when did, when did uh, Dirty Jobs, 2008? No. Dirty Jobs first went on the air in 2003. 2003. So the, even further to the point I'm trying to make here is that it almost anticipated this like 24-7 social media, I don't want to say surveillance culture, but do you know what I mean? Like the way you produced that show, yeah. I think it was, it was kind of ahead of its time. Do you sort of see that? Well, I mean... I don't want to take credit where it isn't due, but I'll tell you this, the, the big lessons for me started on QVC. In fact, it started, when I asked the viewer on live TV, essentially to do my job for me, to help me, and they did, that's when something went like click in my, in my head. But I forgot, you know, I forgot that lesson and it took maybe 15 years for it all to come back around and then realizing again on Dirty Jobs, look, this is, this is not nearly, this is way harder than it needs to be. Mm -hmm. Tell the truth, show up, be in on the joke, and try and remember, look, t it's just TV. So if, if people watch, it's probably because on some level, they would like to be there with you. I'm not talking about like, you know, scripted TV or, or movies necessarily. I'm just talking about real nonfiction reality TV. The shows that typically work in that format are shows where the viewer can go, you know something, they look like they're having a good time. I would like to tag along. And if we can get that, if we can check that box, it doesn't matter what the title is, it doesn't even matter what the show is. These days, people can smell a rat, I think, you know, and if they feel like they're being sold something, they'll respond differently. If it feels authentic, they'll come along for the ride. Yeah, you talk about the space that you're in, right? That reality, unscripted space. Yeah. This show is providing something that is increasingly rare in that space, and that's positivity, right? That's, <laughs> right. That, that's spotlighting people that deserve wholeheartedly to be spotlit. Where did the idea for returning the favor like, come from? Well, it wasn't mine. Um, I, think it, I think it started with a production company called Hudson and somebody over at Facebook. Mm -hmm. And honestly, full disclosure, when they came to me and pitched the show, I, I said, not just no, but hell no. I'm never, I will never host a feel-good show. With great respect to Extreme Home Makeover, it's just not the kind of show I do. I don't, I don't Why, though? Because sometimes, you know, when you watch these shows, for me anyway, it's like you feel a thumb in the small of your back, and it's like pushing you, and it's yeah. manipulating you. And then you're so, you, you see something, and maybe it's poignant, and then you hear cello music. Well, you're, you're just trying to make me cry, right? right. And you're trying right. to make me cry right here. I hate that. Yeah. I, just, I just don't like it. I, it. It feels manufactured to me. So, but we kept talking, you know, and, and, and then somebody in the room said something interesting. They said, look, my news feed is a mess. And my news feeds, I got 5 million people on a Facebook page, right? And this is not news to anybody. You scroll through social nowadays. And, you know, people are unfriending. Old friends are unfriending each other. I don't know if you've noticed, but the country's a little divided, right? And so we're, everybody is just desperate to figure out, you know, you wearing a white hat or a black hat? You good guy or bad guy? You us or them? You know, everything's like this binary choice, right? So people have been divided and polarized, and... Things are ugly on social, and things are ugly on cable. You know, everybody's veins are bulging, there's spits flying through the air, and everybody's pissed off. And I just thought, well, if we can do something every week and put it in people's news feeds that is just real and, uh, and simple, but fundamentally designed to remind you that not everybody in your neighborhood's a schmuck, right? Some people, this is a celebration of people who are slightly better than you and me, you know? people who actually get out of bed in the morning who are agitated because the world's not quite the way they want it, and then do something about it. So the entire show, like Dirty Jobs, is programmed by the viewer. Every idea we get comes to my Facebook page or the Returning the Favor Effect page. We have tens of thousands of nominations. And when I saw that happen, and when I thought about, well, if we can program the show the way we program Dirty Jobs, and if we can shoot the show with that truth cam, I thought, well, maybe, maybe it's a good time to start celebrating decency. So I said, let's try a couple. So we did five. And the first one we put out there uh, has been viewed 30 million times. That's crazy. 30 million. Wild. Yeah. And so, okay, 
I mean, I'm not a genius, but I can read the tea leaves. And so people want to look at something like this. Do they want to watch an hour of it on ABC? I don't know. But in their news feed, when they're scrolling through the fear and the loathing and the pain and the disappointment, you know, and then suddenly they see this, man, I, I, get, I get thousands and thousands of letters every day right now from people saying, you got to come to my little town outside Cleveland. You got to meet Fred. Wait till you see what Fred's doing. Right. I love it. I got to talk to you about one of these uh, people you feature on the show, speaking of little towns and just heroes in these small towns. I believe her name's Ann from Michigan. She's in the first episode. Ann Ruddisil, yeah. Yeah, of, of season three. Yeah. And there's just, just you talk about the truth, Cam, and, and not you know rehearsing anything. There's just the mo one of those honest moments, I really think, that I've seen on a TV show Facebook show is when you greet Anne for the first time and she doesn't say like she doesn't say like hi Mike she doesn't say anything she's like she's like why are you here we're not that big and she keeps repeating that phrase why are you here we're not that big that's it man and I think that just was it sort of encapsulates the whole idea behind these these stars you feature yeah. where they're, they're so selfless they don't want this they don't they would never they do all this amazing work and they would never expect any recognition for it if you want to do a rumination on humility then this is a great show to look at. And for me, too, right? I mean, I, I, did, I did okay for most of my career, but I, I didn't start to do better than okay until I just took a big bite of the crap sandwich, right? I mean, being humble on camera is hard. It's, it's, it's hard. And for just regular people minding their own business, it, it's jarring. Well, and, you know... You're right. Her reaction was great. And I remember thinking, I walked up to the porch, and she's just sitting there, and she goes from confused to flummoxed to baffled to, I mean, it, it, it took her 20 minutes to get her, get her head back on. And, um, and we cut almost all of that into the show. And normally, that doesn't happen. Normally, you play it for a beat, and then you move on to the next scene. But here's the thing about TV in my view, that gets producers in, in a certain amount of trouble. Everybody knows that authenticity is the thing for sale, right? Everybody knows we want that moment you just described. But the things we do in television to get in our own way, you know, to make authenticity hard, you know? Look, it can be, it can be makeup. It can be hair. It can be stop the take, a plane is flying over, the audio is not perfect. Or a cameraman says, hold on a second, we need to do that again, and my frame wasn't right, my focus wasn't right, my white balance wasn't right. My, I, I mean, it's like the reasons that people screw up great moments will break your heart. It's endless. Look at news. Look at any great news anchor, all of them. Why do they all talk like this? Every single one of them does. You know, why do they read a prompter but pretend that they're not reading the prompter? Yeah. You know, why, why is everything filmed and shot and delivered the same way? All of that stuff gets in the way of people actually believing you and being authentic. And yet, we do it over and over and over and over. Uh, sorry for the ramble, but no. essentially, that's, that's the thing that I try and do with whatever project I'm on. Just no second takes. Anything after the second take is what you call a performance. Right. And there's no reason to perform in nonfiction television. It's a great quote. You can use it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I might, sure. I might borrow it. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, I'm cracking up inside over the, um, the news guy voice. Because yeah. I was having a couple drinks with my buddies recently. We were like, where did that start? Because we were watching some documentary, I think, on Netflix. And like dudes in the 60s talk like that. And then they yeah. still talk like that. You can't help it. It's Anchorman. I mean, it's literally, that's why Anchorman was such a funny movie. Right. Because the, the tropes are real. I mean, you, you, it's, it's, like, it's like FM radio. It's like morning DJs. It's amazing. I just did a satellite media tour for this show. That means I wake up at 4.30 in the morning, I call a number, and somebody plugs me into one radio station after the next, after the next. I mean, it's tragic on some level that morning radio in Bangor, Maine, sounds identical to Tallahassee, Florida, right. sounds identical to Sacramento, sounds identical to Phoenix. Move it up a notch in the countdown. Hey, it's wacky. It's the morning zoo. We're all here right now, man. Let's get the caller on the line. Hey, let's play a little Maroon 5. Anybody still listen to them? And you're just like, you just lie there in bed, just getting plugged into one to the next, the next, the next. And it's just going, this is, this is not good. 
It's derivative. You know, it's like the. It's ca- lazy. And it's not real. It's wor- It's like that cat in Pet Cemetery. You remember Pet Cemetery, the the one that comes back to life, right? The pet, the cat dies, and they bury the cat, and then it comes back. It's not really the cat. It's a version of the cat. Right. It's bad kitty, right? There's not a cat. You just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you should. And the more you rip a thing off, well, like what Michael Keaton did, multiplicity. Yeah. So it's like a version. I know of that a- reference. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Read Pet Cemetery. It's, it's it's a comedy. You'll love it. Did you, uh, speaking of you, just made me think of the Super Bowl. Did you watch the Super Bowl? Maroon 5? The Super half? No, you didn't. I was on a plane. Oh, okay. I was on a plane coming not here. Not a big football show. guy? You're not going to like... I was a huge football fan. Yeah. Uh, in 1984, March 29, the Baltimore Colts became the Indianapolis Colts. They left Baltimore in the dead of night. I'll tell you the truth. I never got over it. Really? I was dating a cheerleader at the time. And my For best, the Colts or just yeah, the... Okay. Yeah. And my best friend was in the marching band the Colts marching band. Yeah. You know, we would, I mean, that team was such a part of that town. I grew up in Baltimore, right? And when they left, in the dead of night, in the dead of night, those Mayflower vans took the team, the gear, the marching, all of it gone. Man, I, for me, that's when I realized that the players are represented, the owners are represented, mayors are represented, everybody's represented, everybody's the fans. So I still watch I just don't root for anybody. All right. Not even the Ravens. I'm not against them. <laughs> you know what I am doing? Uh, the Raiders are building a stadium in Vegas. Oh, it's going to be awesome. And I'm narrating that whole project. Are you really? Yeah. And, oh, that's awesome. That stadium, because I run a foundation that runs skilled trades, and they hire thousands of like high-end construction people doing amazing work. Right. And so, yeah, I wanted to be a part of that. Is this the same foundation that does the scholarship? Yeah. Can you talk about this really quick? Because we're running out of time, but I did want to get to it's this. It's called this Microworks. Really cool. It came out of Dirty Jobs. I started in 2008. It's a PR campaign for good jobs that actually exist. We've awarded $5 million so far in work wow. ethic scholarships. We're in the middle of a campaign right now. If you or somebody you know is willing to get their hands dirty, learn a skill that's in demand, go to microworks.org and apply. I'd be happy to give you some free money if you jump through a few hoops. There you go. Something tells me he's done this before. <laughs> Mike, thanks so much. Again, this is available right now, which is cool. We can watch, watch it, it right now. Right after this. I, I would. I mean, you'd be fools not to. Right now, you can just go over there to the Returning the Favor page. And You're if you have on an Facebook idea for already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I need ideas too, because we got a new season after this. So. Oh, it's coming back. Nice. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah nice. No, no, we just keep shooting them. I don't think it's ever going to end. Yeah. Well, 30 million views. <laughs> I think Facebook's probably really happy with that. You know what? Tell them. Yeah. You got to tell them, would you? Yeah. Hey, Facebook. Yeah. All right, one more time for Mike Rowe, everybody. Thanks, guys.